This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Okay, I think we might start now. And uh, friends, uh, students, esteemed colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to you all. And welcome back if you joined us at the British Library for the Boccaccio and Company Day today. I firstly need to set the context for this event, which is given in the series founded by the John Coffin Trust at the School of Advanced Study, University of London. This benefaction came to the university under the will of the late Mr. Arthur Charles Coffin, and in particular, due to his determination that we should not lose sight of the arts and what might be termed the cultural aspects of education. Mr. Coffin further stated in his will that he desired each event to be announced as part of the John Coffin Memorial, and it therefore appears likely that the bequest is in memory of his father John. We are indebted to the Trust's generosity for supporting this remarkable event. And I really cannot think of a better way to wrap this day up than with Marina Warner's Voices Without Borders. Marina is a well-known, well-loved, and much-admired international figure. Introductions, however detailed, are unlikely to do her justice. Her output, both fiction and non-fiction, is little short of prodigious. Her immense scholarship spans the whole of human history to include some 35 books, ranging from the Virgin Mary to poison, from angels to zombies, from murderers to donkeys. <laughs> Not to mention, of course, her impressive productivity in the scientific and the, in the academic press. Described as a writer, mythographer, novelist, short story writer, historian, cultural historian, critic, maître à penser, Marina Warner has depth of human understanding as well as immense scholarship. Warner will be taking us today on a journey across the Mediterranean, across linguistic and political borders, to shed light on the diverse tradition Boccaccio draws on. In this respect, it behoves me to mention the recent critical reorientation towards the cornice narrativa, framing Boccaccio's Decameron, that enormously generative narrative machine we heard much about today. For instance, Amadeo Quandam and Giancarlo Alfano's new edition of Boccaccio's masterpiece sees the cornice as a device that is both static and dynamic, orderly and also mobilized, as it is called into question by responsive readership. So it is within and around this framework, with her gaze firmly fixed on the tension and the kinship between story and history, that Warner will weave her magical fabric. And I need to say, uh, before I conclude, that Marina will talk for about an hour, then she will pause for questions from the floor, and then you're all very cordially invited to a reception in the room next door. So without further ado, I am delighted to give you Marina Warner. Well, it's a great honour to be giving the John Coffin Memorial Lecture, and I must say his message and his legacy is one that's more and more urgent. Um, the idea of supporting the humanities, the arts, as, as elements, necessary elements in education has come under much greater siege recently than when I last gave a John Coffin Memorial Lecture, when it was not even mentioned, I think, because we didn't feel the same crisis. I mean, he was mentioned, but not the actual terms of the legacy that, that I remember, because it wasn't important then so much. It's about 20 years ago, I think, I gave uh, the first one. But uh, I wanted also to thank um, the organisers of the British Library for a most fascinating workshop and images this morning, and what I caught of it. And also, oh, sorry, and also um, Katya very much for introducing me so generously. I won't say framing me, because <laughs> Framing in English has a different, um, <laughs> at least providing a frame, which I hope I will live up to, but I, I dare, I fear I will not, but anyway. A family resemblance runs between the De Camerone and Auf Leila Walela, A Thousand and One Nights. 
In rather the same way that a new parent sees fitting across the features of a newborn child the image of a lost mother or father, so the stories that Boccaccio tells with such exuberant verve bear a likeness in both general mean and habitus, as well as in detail, and again in the same way as features of voice and gait are vividly transmitted from one generation to another, so that a daughter is recognisable from a mere intake of breath on the phone, but might also be her own mother, so the kind of vocal atmosphere of the camera, the story's pace and rhythm, reveal a common bond. Seamus Heaney calls this aspect of the text its characteristic hum. Plots from the nights and echoes of the tales appear in Italian literature long before the tales are first translated for publication, which only happened in 1704, and then ran for several years, in the volumes of the great Orientalist and writer Antoine Gallon. The Italian translation by Francesco Gabriele, lively and still highly readable, appeared in 1948. Centuries after plots, motifs, devices had been circulating through the culture in different media. The Oriental tale provided a reservoir of narrative devices, that is, of ways of telling a story which profoundly affected fiction and drama and other media too later. Yet there is no exact overlap between the tales and the manuscripts which provided Antoine Galland with his source material for Les Milieu et Nuit um, and the, um, the Decamerone. The knights probably settled, grosso modo, into the form which Galland translated around the same time as Boccaccio was alive and writing the Decameron. But of course, several hundred years separate Boccaccio from Galland in terms of readers' and listeners' reception. Does Galland show signs of having read Boccaccio? I leave that to scholars to answer. It's not an area that I've looked at. But if he had read Boccaccio and had been infused even with the most subtle profumo of narrative from him, then the knights in European translation have precursors in narratives composed long after the book began to circulate, thus creating a looking glass inversion and a temporal paradox, the loop of readers and writers that Borges elucidates so brilliantly in Kafka and his precursors and in others of his fables. Borges also explores, with wonderfully rich readings of the different versions of the Knights, how translations gain from the literature of their target language, so that English translators benefit from Chaucer, Shakespeare, the King James, and so forth. And clearly the Italians, with the extraordinary step into the vulgare, the vernacular taken by Dante, have profited incomparably from the weave of voices across texts. An enchained sequence of tales rendered into Italian, carries memory traces inevitably of Boccaccio and other cycles structured in an analogous fashion. In the case of the Knights and the Decameron in English, the case for this twist in chronology is very strong, since Richard Burton, who operated a voracious syncretism in his translation of the Arabian Nights, was shamelessly dependent on the prior labours of his friend John Payne. John Payne also rendered the Decameron into English, published it in 1886, and then a volume of stories from Boccaccio in 1903, two years after he completed and brought out his 15-volume magnum, magnum opus, The Thousand and One Nights. So basically, there's, a, there's something that's impossible, and my students always make these mistakes in chronology. They think that, you know, um, Pope comes before Homer. But in fact, there are ways in which translations do enact that sort of curious reverse chronology. Um, now, I'm not a student of manuscript dissemination, and I haven't been working on the interactions between the Knights and the Decameron and, and its translations before this talk. So this is a terrible rough sketch, really. Nor do I use the comparative methods that rely on the very carefully wrought indices of folk tales and folk motifs and their transmission across cultures. And we actually heard, it rather heartened me, uh, the controversial statement, um, I think, from Kenneth Clark today at the library, um, that the editors of the new Italian edition of the Decameron have said, source history is dead. I think this marvellous imbroglio of stories across time, that often uncanny family resemblances, can open up when looked at in another way. And I'm going to attempt it this evening. It involves tuning into that characteristic hum, the register, timbre, tenor of a work, 
Milton rather surprisingly catches this in his mood poems, with their titles taken from musical terms in Italian. L'allegro, as you know, come and trip it as you go on the light, fantastic toe. In Allegria is a predominant note struck by the kinds of narratives set out in the nights, the broad characteristic spirit and momentum that Calvino, Italo Calvino appreciated as leggerezza. Even when the tales are tragic, fatal, and many of the Arabian night stories are so, the frame asserts their function is to avert a greater catastrophe, to lift and lighten the listener's mood. Tuning into the hum, uh, the listener, of course, is both us, listening to the stories, and the sultan, the ultimate audience of Shahrazad's tale-telling. Tuning into the hum also demands that we attend to the presentation of the, of within the stories of storytelling itself, and to the contested issues at the heart of the stories, sexuality, women's especially, and the function and consequent ethics of fabulism. At the very heart of comic fabulism, as found in the liveliest form in the nights and in the Decameron, lie questions about sex and sexual behavior and sexual ethics, the quarrel of men and women. The Arabian Nights are told in the night by a woman in bed with her husband. Her inspiration must not stop flowing or she will die. She must continue summoning up stories or she and other women will wake up to the reality. It is as if the dreamer must continue to dream on our behalf. Our survival depends on the continued process of her memory because, we are told from the start of the book, Shirazar does not make up the stories. She is clever and learned and has a library of a thousand books and she knows the stories she tells from having read them. Does she know them verbatim? The stories unfold spontaneously, it seems, spoken aloud, directly engaging her audience in the intimate setting of the Sultan's bed. Now and then, in the course of the book, this is a, a children's edition by Andrew Lang, um, which has actually caught unusually in such illustrations of the framed story of the nights, that Shahrazad is telling the story to her little sister, who can't go to sleep. And that's the plot between them. The little sister has been told by Shahrazad, please say, after I've made love to the Sultan, that you want to hear a story before you go to sleep. And, um, and the Sultan is listening in. And those of you will know, and it was discussed this morning, actually, uh, today at the British Library, that very often the stories about women's sexuality are eavesdropped by men. The, uh, the women are telling secrets to one another about what they get up to, and the men are listening in. And that's the same structure here. But, of course, Shahrazad's mission is to enlighten the Sultan that women are not only wicked. Now and then, in the course of the book, we are shown the circumstances in which the stories have been recorded. For example, Harun al-Rashid, after hearing the tales in the house of Zubayde, orders them to be written down in letters of gold and placed in the palace library. Harun's orders, so he's the, he's the ruler inside the story, are echoed by the Sultan Sharia outside the story when he joyfully reprieves Shahrazad at the end and tells the scribes to write down all her stories. However, at the end of the Book of the Arabian Nights, according to some versions, Shahrazad's library is then brought from the vizier's house to the palace. And as the Moroccan scholar Abdul Fattah Kilita has pointed out, this command adds to the dizzy circularity of the nights. This copy will be a copy of something which already exists in the library, that Shahrazad collected as a young, unmarried woman. Except for her own story, that is the only one that she herself does not tell. The prior existence of this vast body of stories adds to the dreamlike quality of the whole. Not exactly a collective unconscious, her library seems to stretch an infinite recession, an archive of all the stories. The thousand and one in the book's title hints at infinity. And indeed, the stories keep multiplying, moving off into different new stories, as well as into multiple versions and translations. The utopian fantasy of the book includes the possibility that someone could act as the keeper of memories on this vast and labyrinthine scale, that someone like Shahrazad could fulfill the role described by the poet Derek Walcott, every collection of human beings gathered for a long time in one place codifies itself, arranges rules of conduct, and makes a calendar for its celebrations of harvest, of the shapes of the moon, with tribal melodies, and preserves its fables and its history in the archives of the shaman 
and the griot and the bard's memory. This is a hope of survival too. Keeping memories alive in the present is a wager against lost time, a stand against entropy, and a sighting of a small light in the general darkness. The frame story that, uh, that, does, that is the only story that Shahrazad does not tell is the story that the Sultan and his brother have both found both, both their wives dallying. And the two brothers then decide that, and they murder their two wives. The two, bro the two, sultan, the two sultans then decide that they're so disgusted with the whole world, especially women, that they, they uh, abandon their palaces and go wandering like beggars in the world. The first person they see is a djinn, jinni, coming out of the sea, um, immensely tall, colossal figure, and in his arms he has a glass box. And he lands on the, he lands on the shore, and he opens the glass box, and out of it comes a beautiful mortal woman whom he has abducted on her wedding day. He goes to sleep, starts snoring. The princes have hidden themselves um, from this terrifying sight in the tree above, and as soon as he's asleep, the beautiful young woman who's been freed from her glass box, here she is coming out of the glass box, spies the princes in the tree and demands that they come down instantly and make love to her. When they, of course, refuse, <laughs> she, she threatens that she will wake the jinni and um, he will, of course, murder them. So the, the very, very unwillingly, <laughs> the kings agree to make love to her. Whereupon she produces, uh, she demands a token from them and for, again threatens the, that she will uh, wake the jinni, her husband, her rap, her, her, rap, her, rap, her rapist, and um, again they will be punished. So, so they do give her rings and she adds them to a bracelet that she has, she brings out of her girdle. And in the English uh, translation she has 99 rings. <laughs> In the Arabic translation, she has 565 <laughs> in the Arabic version. So, so this is a proof to the kings that women, the depths of women's wickedness cannot be fathomed. And so they, that's when Sultan Shariah makes the vow that he will, um, he will take a new virgin bride every day and decapitate her in the morning. Uh, that is the story, of course, that Shahrazad doesn't tell, though she does know it, because that's why she's volunteered to go into the palace and um, tell stories to save herself and other women. There are um, 22 manuscripts of the, I'm just going to, I'll, I'll go back to that, it's an important scene, but I'll just show you. There are only 22 manuscripts containing stories from the knights uh, that have survived, so they're not, then they're not complete. But the numbers of translations and editions and recensions are really not possible to count one manuscript collection, now in the Arcadian Library here in London, not far from here, gives a powerful sense of the way the stories lived in the world where they were made. Thirty Octavo notebooks, written in a variety of hands in the 17th century, with a sprinkling of red leather, red letter headings for the chapter type, story titles. The boards have been softened by handling. The pages are tattered and torn, and in some places patched and edged to stop them falling to pieces. These copies have literally been read to bits. They have every look of a professional storyteller's professional resources. Now, I think you can see in this one um, here, I think that those, those lines with the marks on the left-hand side, um, that could be, um, the, the, sorry, on the right-hand side, could, these could be these little arrow-like things. I think they could be the, the t counting how many people are in the room when he's working. I say he because it's likely to be the public storyteller who, who used these manuscripts. And so there's a cut, reckoning counting off. So it's like an abacus, you know, 10 on below and then something like that. It's, it's, not, it's not certain, it's just my conjecture. And that takes me back to the characteristic way these stories were used. They are written literature, but they are recited. And we don't know, uh, because of course we have no way of knowing, how free the recitals were. But this is a very unusual, a very unique, very exceptional um, manuscript image showing a storyteller at work. It's not, not a manuscript of the Arabian Nights. There is no precious manuscript of the Arabian Nights of this quality. Um, but you can see in the, in the, on the right-hand side, the court storyteller is entertaining the hakawati. The court is entertaining, <coughs> is entertaining the court. 
and he's working without without a book, without notes. So that's and that's. Um, then there's another. The Rylands. Uh, I don't know if she's here. I gave a wonderful talk about the exhibition of the Rylands of the of the Decameron. Um, this is uh, for, also from the Rylands, and this is a very. I didn't know this manuscript when I wrote my book. It, it appeared in an exhibition in Paris recently of the Arabian Nights, and it's a, it's a very unusual illustrated. Um, Illustrated edition. Uh, it's the only illustrated edition I've ever seen, in fact, I mean Arabic illustrated edition. And there you see uh, Shahrazad actually talking, or reciting. But again, no manuscript, no book. The, 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 um, so they belong to written literature, the stories, but their making precedes print and multiple copies and silent reading, broadly speaking. And their form, as well as their transmission, took shape in relation to audiences not silent individual readers. The passage from oral to written and back again is much more complex than a simple contrast between literature and orature, or between literacy and illiteracy. The Thousand and One Nights are a superb example of this process of colloquy and translation, and the stories are enmeshed in Italian feminism long before, as I said, they were translated or known as such at the beginning of the 18th century, until at the beginning of the 18th century. The geography of the Thousand and One Nights coincides with the Hellenistic world when the Mediterranean was a zone of continual conversation, traffic, and interconnectedness. From the ancient site of the Pillars of Hercules at the western edges of North Africa to the eastern seaboard of present-day Syria, Lebanon, Israel, and Palestine, with Sicily and Italy strategically placed at the fulcrum, this middle sea was as lively as if it had not been a body of water but a vast piazza in a great city where the world went to and fro. The stories of the Arabian Nights, dating composition roughly from the 9th to the 14th centuries, reflect in vivid and fascinating detail the various empires that ruled in these regions. Mughal, Abbasid, Umayyad, and Baghdad, Basra, Iblis, Delhi, China, and even Japan appear in the stories. And on the right-hand side, this is the talking heads that hang, grow on the trees of Wakwak. And Wakwak is thought to be Japan. Um, and it appears quite often in the, um, with these magical talking heads, which of course appears in Alexander, the Alexander Romance as well. The stories themselves show every sign of being the product of crisscrossing of peoples and their business and cultures. Their foodstuffs, spices, carpets, glass, jewelry, tableware, clothes, and the customs and values that are concentrated in such goods. The golden age of Andalusia was brilliantly evoked, has been brilliantly evoked in the work of Rosa Maria Menocal, who unfortunately died young earlier this year. And there, on that southern perimeter of Spain, the state of Granada, Greek and Jew, Roman and Arab, Christian and Muslim, Zoroastrian, and perhaps even a worshipper of the ancient gods, lived and worked together, sparking ideas off one another, catalysts as generative as carbon itself, the principle of organic vitality. And that Lucia has become a byword for the kind of harmony and diversity, the mix that is fertile or offensive. But there are other times and places where something similar has happened. And one of the richest and most special, requires a figurative move, is narrative. Not a political entity or a geographical location, but a luogo di memoria and a space of mentalité in action. In stories, people have come together using their imaginations to embroider a common tapestry, to explore tensions and conflicts and dreams of hope, to lay out rules of conduct and to test the limits of convention, to work out ethics. The settings of these stories in the nights do not only provide backdrop, they also mirror the methods of the storytellers in their transmission. The great ports that feature in such tales as the city of brass or Aladdin of the beautiful moles Genova, Livorno, Alexandria, Acre, Nicos Nicosia, Messina, Malta, reappear in the De Camerone. And, and we heard today that um, he, he p spent some time in Naples too, which I didn't know. They are the fora where the stories met and mingled, carried by sailors, merchants, priests, missionaries of all denominations, <coughs> all religions, pilgrims, diplomats, scholars, explorers, soldiers, pirates, doctors, and their entourages. For the story of travelling texts, for in the story of travelling texts, obscure members of a family or a household also matter crucially: servants, nursemaids, captives, slaves, black, white, male, female, 
and children. The tales feature travelers and wanderers as their heroes and their villains. And this, you, you, you who know Boccaccio will recognize this kind of uh, you know, maelstrom of, of characters. They tell of voyages to places near and far. The plots are peripatetic over vast expanses of territory, both on the map and far distant in the outer realms of fairy. Travelling is a characteristic topic of the stories themselves, reproducing the conditions that brought the stories into existence. It's Edward Said in the celebrated essay who explores the idea of the travelling text. The Knights in its entirety is a preeminent example of this metamorphic character of fiction, and within it contains a myriad tales that reflect the process in action. The stories are currency, flowing in circulation across cultures and time zones. There are echoes and overtones in several of Boccaccio's stories with oriental tales that appear in later recensions of the knights, known as the Apocrypha of the Knights. <coughs> and these have counterparts with variations in world folklore. One of these, the Enchanted Pear Tree, which is the Decameron Seventh Night um, story of Ma, Novella 9, uh, Chaucer revisits in The Merchant's Tale, and it appears in two collections of Arabian night stories. Um, one in the manuscript that was commissioned, here's, here it is, the manuscript that was commissioned by Edward Workley Montague, or bought by Edward Workley Montague, I should say. It's my idea that he commissioned it, but anyway, bought by Edward Workley Montague in Egypt from an Egyptian scribe in 1764 and brought back to England by him, where it was read and used by William Beckford. After taking lessons in Arabic and Persian, Beckford translated, reworked, appropriated, and transformed this material in a series of oriental tales, mostly composed in French. And a young scholar, Laurent Chatel, is working on this extremely tangled sheaf of transmissions. At least one work here Montague bundle of manuscripts has gone missing, but this checkered peripatetic history may give you a glimpse of the way a story can become entangled with others. Or, to change a metaphors, think of a mosaic composed of thousands of differently coloured pieces, which over the years has lost a patch here and there, and an artist now and then has filled in the patches with pieces scattered from another section of the original pictorial schema. Such a modus operandi has modifi modified and reconfigured archaeological sites all over the Middle East in particular. Um, I just went to the Louvre's new display of the uh, Islamic collections and they make a great feature of this, that many of the mosaics or other um, uh, pieces on show have been you know, pieced and patched in this way and it's very difficult to uh, disentangle the chronology. But it can also be invoked in connection to literary works. For example, Antoine Galin, this is his... Um, this is a, a possible portrait, it's not certain of him. Tra first translated Sinbad from a separate manuscript, not in the Nights, but when he produced his version of the Arabian Nights, he included the adventures of Sinbad as if it were part of the same manuscript. And since then, the merchant has become a defining figure of the Nights, and his odyssey and adventures an intrinsic element in the minds of most readers and audiences, and not just Western readers and audiences. Ganon's writerly interferences did not stop there. The most popular tales of all, the ones which have since become synonymous with the book, <coughs> excerpted again and again in children's books and retold on st world stage and screen the world over, such as Aladdin and the Wonderful Lamp and Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves, might be his own compositions, um, to pay a kind of tribute to the plots, motifs and style of Arabic storytelling. Scholars are pretty much agreed now that Aladdin and these others are so-called orphan tales, as Mia Gerhardt, a great scholar of the Knights, um, described them. No decisive evidence, one way or another, has yet been found, but there's no Arabic manuscript for Aladdin and, and Ali Baba and others, actually several others, until after Gala. Um, some of these orphans, like Aladdin, may, so may have no Arabic literary parents. And the signs of bricolage are there, Aladdin pieces and patches many elements from different tales in the book. And once you start reading the Arabian Nights, you'll see this process unfolding. So, um, now some scholars feel cheated by Ganon's innovations and apparent deceptions. But on the whole, he's no longer condemned as an arch traditore, traditore, but is emerging instead as a classic writer of independent significance to stand alongside his much more famous contemporaries.
However much he interpreted and altered his sources, brought in his own values and his societal norms of decorum, and in the interests of armchair ethnography, underlined the local color, customs, and sights of the East, Antoine Galland wrought a magnificent fiction for the West. He wrote with gaiety and grace, his enjoyment with material glowing from the page. Many of the liberties he took offer us a model for the new global fiction of today, travelling texts made in the polyvocal echo chamber of literature beyond national boundaries, cultural taboos and different languages. The result of interactions and crossings between peoples and mutual curiosity about one another. His stance inaugurates an ideal enlightenment vision, extolling the virtues of openness, generosity and tolerance, and discovering them in an oriental costume. Boccaccio, likewise, figures as an individual who has been left a large tray of mosaic pieces to assemble into pictures. He has been given models, but he has his own notions of precursors, but he follows his own fancy as he chooses one mosaic tessera here, another there. Many other Orientalist scholars beside Galland, other translators and editors, introduced stories from different sources, and some of them may have derived them from the European corpus of folktales. Richard Burton was omnivorous and fanciful, and he introduced many of his own offspring into the multi-volume version of the Knights he redacted, with voluminous annotations also fantastic. Maldrus, whose lengthy translation of the Knights in the 1890s won the passionate admiration of Mallarmé, Gide, and other contemporaries, mixed his colours on a rich and inventive palette. His French was then rendered into English by Poe's Mathers in the 20s, and it remains one of the most lyrical and fluid knights in English. The resemblances between the apocryphal knights and Boccaccio's tales might originate in the translator's own wide reading, as I mentioned before in connection with John Payne and Richard Burton. But this observation that interlopers might indeed have stolen into the knights from the Decameron and other sources can't be used to infer that they originated in the latter. Where did Boccaccio find them in the first place? Well, we don't know them. He was a formidable scholar himself. So here's Boccaccio's uh, beautiful, the early, the early um, frontispiece. Is it a frontispiece? Yeah, it is the frontispiece. Showing the storytellers assembled. Um, who, and he searched up classical manuscripts. I mean, works such as De Claris Mulieribus retold and revisioned the material he had so brilliantly unearthed, studied, and understood. In the history of fairy tale, Boccaccio plays a key role, for it was he who discovered in the monastic library of Monte Cassino the only manuscript in existence, so far, of the transformations of Lucius or the Golden Ass by Apuleius, which includes the tale of Cupid and Psyche, forerunner and progenitor of the Beauty and the Beast. The Golden Ass intercalates stories within stories, and the famous fable about the god of love and the mortal beauty, whose name means soul in Greek, as you know, is set inside the frame story of Lucifer's <coughs> plight as a donkey. The tale is set in opposition to the main narrative, and its structural position illuminates the role of storytelling in the Decameron and in the Nights. <coughs> Lucius, in his donkey shape, has been, you see him there on the left, has been seized by bandits and put to hard labor for them. From his muted and enslaved state in the robber's cave, he witnesses the arrival of Carite, a young girl who has been abducted on her wedding day and separated from her beloved Ptolemus, sorry, Tepolemus, her future husband. The old woman, a disreputable bored by Apuleius's account, is told to keep an eye on her by the robbers. And when she's confronted by the weeping girl, she announces that she will tell her a story to make her feel a little better. The fairy tale follows and ends with the reconciliation of the lovers, the clemency of Venus who had opposed them furiously, and the birth of their baby, whose name is Pleasure, Voluptas. The frame story here, however, functions as counterpoint to this joyous story, because nothing of the kind will happen to Carité and her husband, who, after many brutal misadventures, will eventually be killed offstage, casually. And Three significant and interwoven strands can be picked out from the encounter of Boccaccio with the Golden Ass, and these give me um, these give me the threads I want to weave um, about these family resemblances. 
First, the highly worked, elegant fairy tale, enclosed in his picaresque and often um, salacious proto novel, is given up to us to read in the guise of an oral story from a popular low source. Secondly, the declared purpose of the tale is consolatory. The old woman embarks on it, she declares, to make Carité feel a little better. But then the story itself is shown up as offering false hope, as deceptive, wishful thinking and hollow. The larger narrative undercuts the promise of the story. The juxtaposition implicitly contrasts one kind of story with another, one kind of voice, the old woman's orality, with another kind of text, Lucius's autobiographical account of his ordeal and reprieve, an act of memory and witness on his part. It also sets out an argument for the audience about the truth of fiction and the scope of its ambitions. Another shared family feature arises from the imagined narrator or narrators. This strand is intertwined with the previous observations I made. On the one hand, the imagined voice of the storyteller in the story, there are, these are the old woman in the robber's cave, or Shahrazad, or the fugitives from the plague in the Cameron, or the pilgrims to Canterbury, and on the other, the author who is passing on the story to us, Apuleius, the many anonymous composers of the nights, plus the story's translators, who are mostly, if not all, male, and Boccaccio himself. This antiphonal chorus explores questions about the relations between men and women, and this process of interrogation revolves obsessively around women's lustful tendencies and their cunning talent for finding gratification and release. Cuckoldry is the preeminent fertile ground for narrative in these works, and with its premise is made of a belief in women's excessive sexual appetite. This develops in turn and ideas of female ingenuity and their and female ingenuity and their constant devices. Arabic has several words for women's wiles, and the knights explore as Italian does too, and the knights explore the range of female passions and inventiveness. But the cycle pits this form of literary expression against another. The knights answers misogynistic folklore through the alternative popular didactic form, also very ancient known as the Mirror of Princes. These are manuals of instruction composed in the form of fables to illuminate rulers or future rulers and show them ways of justice, mercy, magnanimity, and wisdom. These elements are vitally active in the night and crucial to the book's framing device. Charizard in Bed with the Sultan is telling her sister Dunyazad stories to save her life. She's using her charms, storytelling takes place after sex, and her wit and ingenuity to manipulate the sultan, who, when he overhears the fables Charizard knows, will see more clearly and set aside his all-consuming rage against women, and realize from the rich texture and complexity of her tales that he has jumped to conclusions too quickly, and that to reach for punishment and murder as a remedy is folly. And I was struck this morning that with something that hadn't, that hadn't struck me before, and that is that actually the plague in Boccaccio's frame story um, mirrors the plague which is descended on the country because of Sharia's rage. So the plague is actually physically embodied in the disease um, in Florence, but whereas in the nights it's a figurative plague that is, that's turned, of course, real in the sense that he's murdering everyone, but it's the rage, it's the sickness, the sickness of the man's mind. So there's an element in which that apotropaic uh, function of the stories is common to both and repelling it is acting as antidote to plague. But the Book of the Nights, in its own setting, a place of making, was not prized as classical in Arabic literature until the mid-20th century. It was considered kurafa, trifles, and that's the first time we hear of it in the 9th century. It's referred to as kurafa, trifles, and the only thing we hear about it at that point is that it's got this framed story of a woman telling stories to save her life. It was considered a variety of pulp fiction. Its character changed for its reception in Europe when Ganar rewrote it in the French years in the early Enlightenment. And um, the fascinating talk we heard from Letizia Panizza about censorship, that much of that could be exactly calced onto what happened to the knights, even the school editions that she talked about, the De Camerone the way that this uh, salacious literature had to be cleaned up for mass consumption and is only now being um, given definitive editions that are, are unexpurgated. 
And it's since travelled all over the world and been re reanimated now as prima materia for literary reworkings in its own original territories by writers in Arabic and French. But it is the case that Ganon's enterprise took place in the afterglow of Renaissance literature that had installed appreciation of folk narrative as source. Ganon does not have to have known Straparola, uh, also a collector of, of stories like Boccaccio, or Shakespeare directly, to be imbued with an appetite for vernacular, popular, salacious stories and be committed, almost without money or passé, to their potential for literary metamorphosis, stature, and upward mobility. The process whereby a story moves from recitation, performance, and the scene of storytelling into the precious manuscript or the sanctum of the library has been fascinatingly explored by the classical scholar Florence Dupont in her study, The Invention of Literature, 1999. She proposes a different model from the straightforward contrast between the written and the oral, demonstrating that some of the greatest works of human imagination were created as texts, as written literature, but to be performed, to be heard. <coughs> Voicing was an art of living creators who took a piece of writing and worked with it as singers or players worked with a score, or perhaps even more closely as jazz soloists take up a tune and improvise on it. On it. The voice of the storyteller was many, and the stories created were all different and the same at one and the same time. Immutable inscription, writing, she argues, was used for tallies, for the law, and for other reckonings intended to be solid and permanent. But narration belonged to the different order of time, flowing time, mutability, chromatic harmony. Every listener became and becomes a potential new storyteller. Early literature, she declares, was composed of play scripts and prompt books, storyteller scrolls, pattern books. She writes in her commentary on The Golden Ass, the book that moderns have mistakenly called a novel seems in truth to have, to constitute, to have constituted an intermediary between two kinds of morality. Literature was a speech act performed by living voices present to their audiences, as in many arts events today, with poets in particular. Writing, according to Dupont's reading, represented an attempt to capture those voices. The book became a kind of early phonograph, which would preserve the dead and bring them back, living and audible, into time present. When books established canonical fixed texts, they turned into death masks, her, ter her term, entombing the once living voices that made the sounds of the words, and in the absence of those voices, Dupont, sorry, those once living beings and bodies that made the sounds of the words. In the absence of those bodies, Dupont writes, literature, when enclosed in a book, was fated to draw attention endlessly to that absence, as she describes the hauntedness of texts. In this sense, Charazar is speaking against death in another way, besides her stratagem of endless delay. And this is re re echoed by the Decameron too. The appeal of the stories she tells arises from their availability for retelling, the vitality of their very lack of definitive form. The Decameron, both individual stories from it and as a whole, was translated early on into different European languages. Um, in, the, in the first, first translator's preface, he seems anxious to defend the Decameron from the scurrilous reputation it has acquired. This is 1620. Claiming that Boccaccio, like Aesop, gives his stories a judicious moral application. The title page shows a compliment. Sorry, I, got, I think I'd better. I think I'm going to skip. I'll just tell you one or two of the stories that. Um, because I think I'm going to question. So, um, this, so, so um, one, of the, um, one of the stories that um, struck me is quite extraordinary that Boccaccio hadn't told it is the story of Camaralzaman and Badura. Anyway, so I'll go to that. This is, this is a wonderful still from Pasolini's version of it. Um, he calls her Zumurud and not Badura because he mixes it with another story. <coughs> um, he and Dacia Maraini, who was his uh, co-scriptwriter, in a very cunning, um, very cunning uh, reworking of the night. Um, Cacodry, adultery, and concomitant misanthropy with an emphasis on the misogynistic tendencies of such, run through the Decameron and the Knights. The female storytellers' voices are sometimes oddly contradictory in their message about women's wives. Shahrazad's tales include fiendish enchantresses, 
and memorably a cruel husband batra in the last story of all, Karuf the Cobbler. But one way Boccaccio chimes with the knights concerns the stability of gender in the first place. The circle of listeners are asked to pay attention to semblances and dissembling in varied respects, but several plots aim their inquiries at appearances of maleness and femaleness. In the knights, the most pungent, hilarious, and wonderfully chivalric romance bed trick exemplifies the double tongue of such storytelling because it demonstrates the dazzling wiliness of the lure of the heroine. She's been separated from her husband, Kamar al-Zaman, because he followed a bird. He stole her talisman from her when she was sleeping, and that bird stole it from him, and so he follows the bird, and he gets completely lost. And she wakes, so she wakes up in the desert um, and finds her husband gone. But she keeps her wits about her, and she realizes that she will forfeit all her liberty as a married woman, who, for whatever reason, has lost her husband. So she changes roles with Kamal, putting on his clothes, deepening her voice, and assuming his authority. The two of them, we've been told, are as like as like in their radiant beauty. And so her trick works. She and her followers strike camp, and they set out again on their journey, reaching the Ebony Isles, where the ruler's daughter, Hayat al-Nufus, was one of the most beautiful young women of the times, and is looking for a husband. Badura, disguised as Kamar, finds to her embarrassment that she has every quality the princess and her father desire. He is old and failing, and seeing Badura in disguise, he gladly hands over his powers and his kingdom. Within a matter of days, she has been officially united with Hayat and declared the ruler of the Ebony Islands at her side. And Pasolini gives her a sort of pharaonic um, beard, you know, the, a, a, a pharaonic kind of, a bit of a fantasy, but sort of pharaonic crown. Um, after a few nights have passed since the wedding, Hyatt is furious. Her husband's indifference to her is an insult and unnatural, and she explodes with reproaches so vehemently and distressingly that Badura confesses. She speaks with her woman's voice, she opens her robes, and she shows Hyatt her breasts and her body. Shahrazad breaks off at this point. The dawn is visible, speaking no longer permitted. Hyatt does not take umbrage with Badura's deception. He takes pity on her story of her lost wife and enters into the conspiracy with her. The next morning she kills a chicken and shows her bloodied nightdress to her mother and her servants so that everyone can rejoice. Together, the two of them dispense justice in the Ebony Islands, while Badura still yearns to find Kamar again. Eventually he gets, by very, it's one of these very long picaresque novels, uh, so eventually he returns and he doesn't recognise Badura. Um, so he gets home, and um, she, she, she realizes it's him. When he arrives, she recognizes that he is indeed her lost husband, Kamar al-Zaman, whom she has longed for all this long gap of time they have been parted by destiny. But Kamar does not recognize her, or rather he does not see Badura and the double of himself in the mirror whom he encounters in the new ruler of the Ebony Islands. Badura takes Hayat into her confidence but she does not yet reveal herself to Kamar. Instead, she covers him with honors, feasts him, orders spending clothes for him, and showers him with gifts and establishes him in offices of state. When he wonders at all this, the ruler of the Ebony Isles confesses that love is the cause. Kamar blushes with shame. How could the king, who has all the loveliest women in the world at his beck and call, want such a shameful thing? It is pre presented as shameful, homosexuality in the story. He protests, he resists, but the king insists. Only this once, says Kamar. Weeping, he is led to the royal bedchamber and there takes off his clothes. Pass your hand between my thighs as you must, orders the false king. I don't know anything about these things, sobs Kamar. But as his hand is guided to the place, the Dura bursts out laughing. My friend, how quickly you have forgotten the nights that we have spent together. In this way, she reveals herself to her love, her husband, who takes her in his arms. And all that night, they talk about what has happened to them since they lost each other. Wendy Doniger sees this trial of ordeal is much more prolonged than I've given you, so it's quite explicit and much more prolonged, and the sort of, you know, homosexual rape is very much sort of in the air of the story. Now, but Doniger, who's written a brilliant book on the bed trip, I'm sure you know, sees this trial of ordeal forced on Kamar as revenge on Badura's part for his feckless abandonment of her earlier his easy distractedness and his ineffective 
efforts to regain her. But I find the pleasure the story takes in its own twists and turns so infectious that I don't pause to consider the character's motives. In either case, whether one looks askance at Badura's threat of homosexual rape or not, she is a supreme female trickster, and the dinuma is satisfyingly neat, as it is in All's Well that Elm's Well, when Helena likewise dupes Bertram and so wins his love, and of course we now are on deck Cameron territory. One difference, at least between one difference, at least between the bed tricks in All's Well, in Cameron All's Well, and this one, is crucial. Kamal resists partly because he is loyal to Badura, while Bertram of course, shows no such memory or inclination at all um, to Helena as Helena, but only Helena travels to his diner. I think it's possible to argue that had Boccaccio heard or come upon Kamarazaman and Badura in some form, he would most certainly have taken it and revisioned it. He does shift and shuffle gender in several other stories, for example. I don't even know that I look good. So I am... Um, the, 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 I think... I was going to do two more that he's... But I think we're getting to... to, to do um, just I'll do this one. One story that does occur in Richard Burton's Nights, which was taken, taken from a single Arabic manuscript appearance in the work of Montague manuscript I showed, is a fablio, a comic parable about a man who is gulled by his friends into believing he's pregnant, and then parted with his recent legacy from his aunt to buy the fine ingredients needed for the remedy, and regale his heartless gang of supposed friends with the delicious dishes they produce. The ultimately successful abortifacient of his phantom pregnancy, or in other terms, the phallic medicine that restores him to his manhood. But the important point to make about its appearance in the Decameron connects to the theme of illusion in numerous stories. The artist Calandrino is a classic dumbling of folklore. He appears in several stories being duped by his friends. And his dumbness consists in his inability to retain and act upon basic articles of sexual difference. The lesson of the story grounds sense in understanding the impossibility of a male body having a baby like a female body. The storyteller entertains the company by appealing to a founding principle they share. However, as with the insistent theme of cuckoldry, the joke on Calandrino projects an anxiety about masculine identity or points to a deficiency. In the Wortley Montague manuscript of the Knights, the story appears with significant differences, revealing the changing register of Boccaccio in relation to moral illumination and also shifting attention from the direct struggle of women against men, much the subject of the knights, to something more profoundly cynical and ultimately angrier. The history of the Kadi who bear a babe is primarily a story about a vicious husband and his comeuppance at the hands of his last clever wife and his resulting repentance and change of conduct. It mirrors the frame story, as so many tales in the knights do, offering the hope of conversion to the listeners using the tale as a tool to improve tyrants and abusers' behavior. You may think this is a vain hope, but it remains a powerful driving energy and narrative and a vision of its function. The Kadi of Tarabulus in Syria is a Scrooge, in the habit of starving his wives and then cutting off their noses if she complains, and then cutting off her nose if she complains, and then repudiating her. The very strange thing about reading the Knights is that because the geography is the geography of the current release, these tyrants and sultans constantly ring incredible reminders of present day horrors. But when he marries a woman from Mosul, she has the measure of him. She cooks him a meal and swells him up and persuades him that he's now having a baby. Even better, she then borrows a baby from a neighbor and presents it to him, describing how he's just given birth to it. He's so ashamed of this that he leaves home and takes to wandering. His wife finds his money hidden away, he's a miser, he's hidden his money, and she distributes it among her predecessors. In the meantime, his story is being gossiped about high and low, and everywhere he goes, his ears burn. Eventually, the caliph in Baghdad also hears of his case, and he's summoned and with his wife to his presence, and the Qadi is made to ask for forgiveness and change his ways. The pregnancy symbolizes a loss of manhood, hence the Qadi's shame. So the tale turns on an existing inferiority of the female body as assumed, or rather on the inappropriateness of men's bodies having women's functions. The translation or mix-up causes disorder, 
But this disorder reproduces the horrific transgression, the tale implies, of the Cardi's stinginess and cruelty, which Calandrino, in Boccaccio, is foolish not to recognize. You could recognize echoes with Bluebeard, too, especially with versions of that European household fairy tale that feature trickster female heroines, trickster heroine, such as Italo Calvino's Silver Nose, a story he especially liked, he said. So, um, I just now, I'm just going to conclude. Um, I became very obsessed with the motif of flying, flying as an image of imagination and action, and enacted in the Arabian Nights. And the, um, the, the chief, the most powerful flyer of all is Solomon, because he owns the magic carpet, and that's his vehicle, which is carried for him by a djinn. Um, and the motif of flying furniture, which is going to be the title of one of my chapters, but wasn't in the end, <laughs> obsessed me for a time. And you will all know that there's a marvelous flying piece of furniture in the camera. Um, so this is the story of the Latin in the Knights in the Arabian. This is an example where the, um, the motif has not been tabulated as a shared motif by the, by the folklorists. I mean, it's just there's a flying bed that appears in this story, Aladdin with the beautiful moles, and in several other stories in the Knights. And then it reappears marvelously and oriental in Torello, the story of Torello and Saladin in the Decameron. So that's a very delightful floor poster flying. <laughs> um, this is their method of transport from back to um, Cairo, from Ale back to Alexandria from Baghdad after the, the two lovers have found each other after many vicissitudes. Um, we saw one or two Cassoni paintings of um, Boccaccio. And Cassoni are very interesting because they're moral instruction for marriage. And Griselda being a, a, a favorite subject was probably being used to, to warn in exactly the same way as Shahrazad is warning the Sultan about his bad behavior. Again, we, rather, than, in, rather than enjoying Griselda-like behavior on the wife, it's, a, I think, enjoying better, good behavior on the, since they were, the Cassoni were made mostly for the brides. Uh, rather than for the bridegroom. It's her, her message to him. So this is another one. This is a Cassoni in which this very story, the story of Torello, being returned to his wife through the, through the generosity of Saladin in a wonderful flying bed, um, which uh, takes him back home. I don't read it up, but to, to, to finish, I'll just read it that beautiful bit. So um, it's the ninth story of the last day. It's just the penultimate story, in fact. Um, it's partly set in Alexandria, and it features Saladin as a magnanimous ruler, a loyal friend. And Torello has been taken prisoner on a crusade, but is noticed by Saladin for his skill in training hawks. And the Sultan has not forgotten that Torello once gave him shelter, and so he treats him lavishly. When he learns how much Torello misses his wife, he summons a magician to help spirit the Italian knight back to Pavia. Pavia. The magician says it can be done, but Torello must be asleep. So Saladin orders for him the fabulous oriental bed, fashioned in the style of the East, with mattresses covered all over in velvet and cloth of gold, and Saladin had it but decked with a quilt, embroidered with enormous pearls, and the finest of precious stones geometrically arranged. And finally, he had two pillars placed upon it. And so he sails away from Alexandria uh, to Italy. And when he wakes up the next day, he finds to his joy and to the general astonishment of all that he has landed in this sumptuous um, bed in the nave of his parish church, just in time to forestall his wife's wedding to another man. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what was... <laughs> okay. Um, so um, I just want to end with a political point. The cross currents between Oriental and European fabulous storytelling run so deep that it's no more possible to identify this stream or that than it is to separate the elements of a blended wine. But it is clear that the Oriental wonder tale operates according to conventions that liberate storymakers from observing their similitude, logic, probability, and also free them, us, from gravitas. It was this quality of leggerezza, lightness, in fantastic literature such as the Knights, that Calvino picks out with a special love in his great sequence of essays, Six Memos for the Next Millennium. He identifies its presence as a quality of, work, of the work itself, of its humor, its vivacity, and its imaginative 
flights. But he also delights in the way lightness materialises in literal acts of flying and levitation. Taking up the question of a rationale for such enchantments, in his, in his classic essay he writes, Whenever humanity seems condemned to heaviness, I think I should fly like Perseus into a different space. I don't mean escaping into dreams or into the irrational. I mean that I have to change my approach, look at the world from a different perspective, with a different logic, and with fresh methods of cognition and verification. Calvino, as you know, created a standard anthology of Italian fairy tales and wrote a series of extremely learned essays on La Fiaba, and he paid tribute to the Arabian Nights with his own highly wrought novels, If on a Winter's Night, A Traveller, and Invisible Cities. His thoughts on lightness shift between magic and physics, fact and fiction, without clear demarcation in the manner of such literature and enchantment. I am accustomed to consider literature a search for knowledge, he wrote. Then he moved on to different revealing territory. In order to move on to existential ground, I have to think of literature as extended to anthropology and ethnology and mythology. Faced with the precarious existence of tribal life, with drought, sickness, evil tendencies, Shaman responded by ridding his body of weight and flying to another world, another level of perception, where he could find the strength to change the face of, reality, of reality. These visions of flight were part of the folk imagination, or we might say of lived experience. It is this anthropological device that literature perpetuates. This is a manifesto for literary imagination. And the passage enacts the way the imagery of flying in fairy tales cannot remain, cannot remain grounded, but keeps taking off into metaphor. The Arabian Nights is a profane work, like the Decameron. The lift it offers is of a different order from mystical ecstasy. As Calvino sees, the stories take wing for a variety of purposes. Jessica Nettiffin has written a good book on contemporary fairy tales. This is the conclusion. Observes perceptively that fairy tale as a genre carries within it a profound contradiction. The ideological implications of this continuing popularity in the mass media are complex and at times problematical, given fairy tale's peculiarly coherent surface and its, and its ability to give a deeply satisfying and utopian gloss to assumptions about society, power, and gender, which are often profoundly reactionary. The traditionalist conservatism of the form makes its appeal, especially to dissidents, even more noteworthy. Yet the two greatest masters of the rational mode of in the second half of the 20th century, Italo Calvino and Angelo Carter, were both self-declared leftists. Carter, younger than Calvino, was shaped by his imaginative solutions to the status of fiction itself. And Calvino, of course, is absolutely steeped in his extraordinarily literary imagination, as you know, totally steeped in, in his predecessors and in Boccaccio. Calvino's parents were both biologists, and he brought scientific method to literature with a marvelous flair. And he, he had been, like his parents, an anti fascist. He'd fought as a partisan, agnostic, and anti clerical. And the fairy tale to him was ultimately more honest about literature, so more honest, more honest as literature than realism. Verismo, because it admitted its own condition as illusion. And that is one of the messages that many of Boccaccio's stories tell, the constant warnings of the power of the story to create reality. And so in that sense, they are constantly teaching us. Um, Boccaccio's teaching us, I think, in the way that the knights are teaching us. Um, that the Enlightenment is also a, 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 an artificial structure. Um, so, um, and I'm now going to end with the most beautiful um, quotation from Calvino, which I'm sure all of you know, um, but it's just to me so, um, so important. His most beautiful novel, Invisible Cities, builds 55 castles in the air and then meditates in lapidary, exquisite dialogues between Marco Polo and Kublai Khan, the Oriental atmosphere again, on the varieties of peoples and their customs. Closing lines crystallize wisdom literature's caution with regard to fairy tales' promises. When Marco Polo says, "There are two ways to escape suffering," so, sorry, there are two ways to escape suffering inferno. The first is easy for many: accept the inferno and become such a part of it that you can no longer see it. The second is risky and demands constant vigilance and apprehension. Seek and learn to recognize who and what 
in the midst of inferno or not inferno and make them endure, give them space. These famous words are a philosopher's creed, a psychiatrist's counsel, a sensitive and admirable individual's wisdom, as well as a description of the best function of the one tale. Thank you. Thank you so very much. <laughs> you catch your breath. Thank you. Um, thank you. And uh, thank you so much, particularly for your, I'm very grateful for your political message and also for creating this um, image of the Decameron as an echo chamber, you know, highlighting the tonal and the sort of vocal dimension of the, of the text. Um, while Marina catches her breath, can I, I have a microphone, a roving microphone here. Can I ask you to think about uh, uh, questions. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of food for thought here, and uh, I'd be very grateful for your comments yeah. or questions to mm -hmm. Marina. Uh, I have to um, put this on first. Um, you mentioned that um, in the Arabian Nights there is this function of the story as delaying something and you said that's present in Boccaccio as well and obviously the Brigata are kind of um, go away out of the city to kind of pass time and entertain themselves during the play. But I was also wondering, um, from what I remember in the Decameron there is also a theme of putting an end to the storytelling because you know, other people might think that it's what they're doing is not, you know, is uh, it's a bit dodgy. So you know, they kind of have to um, get back to the city. And so there's also there's also an idea of, of kind of order, very much kind of running through the whole work and and uh, and putting an end to the story. That seems to me to be a part of this. And I wonder if there's any of that in the Arabian Nights, which I have to confess I don't know. Yes. So. Um, actually, I was very struck. I reread the prologue um, because, um, you know, of doing this paper, and um, I was very struck how long the um, description of people who are avoiding, you know, who are sort of throwing off their responsibilities is. So that there's a sort of implicit criticism there, quite strong. The, um, you know, in the Arabian Nights, there's a very mysterious formula. It's quite a beautiful formula, which is. Um, it was break of day and speaking was no longer permitted. And I had no idea what, why, you know, <laughs> it seems so strange. And actually, one of the ways that the stories have been censored is that um, um, the, the translations tend to say that Dinazad wakes them up at dawn, it wakes them up before dawn, and then when dawn comes, well, you know, this, the Sultan would have definitely beheaded her if that's what she did, was wake him up before dawn. No, what happens is they're, they're in bed together with Dinazat on the side, sometimes in bed too. Um, um, uh, you know, this is a, they're young people, they're staying up late. They're staying up late telling stories. Now the point of how, why this is an answer to your question is that I, I then asked uh, Ahaka Wati from Morocco, um, and uh, who's um, Nasir Kemir, who's a wonderful filmmaker as well, who's also recite stories. And, and he said, ah, that's because stories are profane, and when the light comes, the day is for God. So this, the night is this time of, so there's, so, so to his ears, that the whole setting in the bed, in the night, the stories of these very worldly things that are going on, and there's only an invocation to Allah, it's absolutely not a kind of pious book at all. Um, so, that, so that they are absolutely strictly profane, and, and, and I think that you know that that is part of the reason for their lack of reputation in their own territories until the modern period. You know, they were this kind of pop fiction, as I said, they're sort of entertaining trifles, amusing, but definitely not. The, and and then another 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 uh, parallel which I could have made much more of. Um, 
if I knew more about it, uh, I knew Arabic, <laughs> um, is that it's a vulgar Arabic, and therefore it was, it was, it's a vernacular, and it, it was <coughs> therefore despised. It never entered the classical Arabic canon because it's absolutely not beautiful Arabic. It's a, and so in that sense, it, it didn't have someone like Dante or Boccaccio to reclaim it. It, it remained, you know, there wasn't some great figure from Arabic. Uh, you know, classical literature, who said, I am going to use this language now, and therefore made, proclaimed it. So in that sense, it remained you know, profane, vulgar, and dubious, definitely dubious. And the material is dubious, you know, there's so much sex, and lots of drinking, lots of, lots of carousing, lots of singing, lots of dancing. I, I started writing about it because I thought it was such a wonderful corrective to it, fundamentalism. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, and that, Islam is that too. Thank you very much for um, a tour de force, really. And I'm reeling a bit. <laughs> No. Um, I wanted to ask you about the relationship between text and image mm -hmm. because you yes, have yes. talked a lot about it. You've, you've shown us some wonderful images <coughs> and images in books as well, mm -hmm. often. I mean, there's a, a cassone there, mm -hmm. um, probably installed into a bedroom, mm -hmm. um, a highly charged ethical environment, uh, installed usually for the, the wedding night, actually, so a highly charged yeah. moment in the life carried, of a Carried on the street by the bride carried, to carried, a new house. Um, these ones probably weren't. By the time these ones were being made, uh, they probably weren't being carried in the street, but uh, the earlier ones certainly were, which were less decorated. These ones were probably installed, uh, especially the more decorated ones, get, get installed into the house. Mm -hmm. Uh, for the for the for the, the the big night, as it were, and so it's a, a highly charged environment and a highly charged moment in the life of the bride and groom, indeed, mor moral and ethical. And I'm just wondering about the relationship between text and image, and especially dubious stories, and how, uh, as a shared space, I mean, you're kind of ended with a very charged political uh, kind of statement, uh, and and the importance of the shared space. Uh, Stefano Rossa at, at, at the end of the, which you didn't hear, but uh, was talking, he's talking about community and comunitas and, and, the, and how we create communities in, in texts, really. And I'm wondering how that works. Do, I mean, do they work differently in, in, in imagery and text in, in the Thousand One Nights? Well, I, well um, I, I think that um, the illustrations of the nights have been extremely, absolutely central to the, the meaning they've com the stories have conveyed, and also the, the pantomimes and the plays and the films. Maybe I should stand up the microphone, sorry. Um, yes, the, um, the, the, the films, and I mean, there's been such a huge, you know, uh, graphic world around the Arabian Nights. They're constantly invoked by advertisements, for example, um, the sort of pleasures of the nights. And so, and so, um, and I did decided I couldn't do that as well in my book, but I, I, I was sorry, and I would like to do more on it. I've done a little bit more work on it. It, there, it's very, very important, the um, vividness of illustrations, especially on the young mind. And uh, the first sort of experiences of, um, of seeing uh, stories, the picture, I mean, I'm sure most of us in this room can remember images from picture books in our youth. They imprint very, very strongly. And they also have a similar analogous movement, as I described with the text, and in terms of that, and I think someone... Um, the person who spoke, yes, Michael, um, sorry, you, um, you might, I can't remember your first name, sorry, Mike Leedes. Uh, anyway, um, Professor Mike Leedes said, uh, from the British Library, showed us a lot of illustrations, a lot of images, of paintings and evocations, but then you began to show that they echoed each other, they reprised each other, or they reprised other, they also become a kind of echo chamber. And so there is that kind of transmission as well. And that's really where Orientalism really took root. I mean, the idea of the sort of lascivious... Uh, it's very hard to find an image of Shahrazad. In, I showed you one that looks like a storytelling scene. But most of the time, she's sort of coiled around in like a python. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the story is very clear that she's telling it to Dinazad, to her sister. So she shouldn't be coiled around the... the I mean, that's not... You know, but that's how 
not the children's books, but the adult books. The children's books tend to uh, minimize her age. She becomes a kind of child, which is often kneeling in the throne room, sort of imploring him. So there's a lot of, and all that sets it up in a very, because of course you never get the full length in any of these editions. You only get a very, very short um, epitome of, you never get the full, hundreds of pages, even the frame story. Perhaps, no, not perhaps hundreds of pages, a hundred pages of the frame story. And many, many stories embedded within them. I mean, to, put, to dissuade her, for example, to dissuade Shahrazad from going to the palace and becoming the latest wife of the Sultan, her father tells her at least three stories, moral stories to prevent her. Yeah. Can I ask a quick question? I was really struck by what you just said, almost in passing, but it sounds very fundamental, about the idea of storytelling as a corrective to fundamentalism, as an antidote to, to kind of fundamentalism. And in a sense, it's something Boccaccio, I think, struggles with in terms of the kind of literal sense of, or the, the control of the interpretation of biblical text on the part mm. of the mm. parents. Yeah, very, very you know, sort of similar yeah. thing. Mm. And I was just wondering, you ended with that quotation from The Visible City from Calvino, of whether, is there any evidence of storytelling traditions, thinking again about telling stories within infernal contexts, in concentration camps? Is there a, is there a, a tradition of oral storytelling that have certain framed structures almost um, within the Holocaust context? I would hesitate to um, comment because I'm not that well read in, in Holocaust diaries and mem memoirs of survivors. Um, there's of course an absolutely famous scene in Primo Levi's, I see, you, so, you know, sorry. What is it? Yes, where he, you know, he goes on um, ration duty with um, his friend. I forget the name, the name of the friend. And they carry their little pails or whatever to go and get these ghastly rations. And they both remember the scene of Ulysses um, and from Dante and tell it to each other. So that's an example. Of, and, and, and Primo Levi makes a point of that being a moment where they're not there anymore, where they've actually, you know, taken flight. Um, so, and, but I think that, you know, someone like Charlotte Solomon, who, you know, chronicled, before she was killed, chronicled her life in the, in the camp, um, making these extraordinary, beautiful drawings and with, with stories underneath them. You know, that, that's an example of this sort of, uh, and that's not oral, um, I mean, it's difficult to get evidence of oral transmission because, in this case, so many died. I mean, but I suppose, you know, Roberto Benigni's film is about that too, isn't it? And, and I mean, that's a complicated film because he, he he's showing that it's illusion, it's completely illusion. But, but it's very Boccaccio in spirit. Where they, you, do you know the what? What is it called? The film? Yeah. It, a vita verde, yeah. no. A vita verde. I mean, it's terribly poignant that he raises this great edifice of illusion to save his child. Thank you very much also. Apologies to everyone for the phone. <laughs> um, I'm just intrigued by the women coming out of the glass boxes. And yes. I was wondering if you could say mm -hmm. a bit more about that and kind of the background to that. Yes, yes well, you're quite right, because you've picked up on, you know, the, that's what I meant about these sort of strange family resemblances, these sort of flitting things that go past your glass box. <laughs> Where's that suddenly come from? Um, it's older than our first version of Snow White. I mean, it's, um, it's, it's, it's not the same plot. I mean, Snow White is not actually um, yet married to thee. She's not, a, she's not an abducted bride. But of course, the abducted bride is Karate. So again, you have this, you know, these strange, this constant sense of being in a place where, you know, the, the echoes are just bouncing off the walls all the time. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's one of those, I think it's one of those motifs where, the symbolism is um, overwhelming the, 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 any kind of verisimilitude. Um, and it's quite funny to see how the illustrators sometimes struggle 
as to how he would have carried her in his blast box and kept it secure. And, um, and the, in Burton's first illustrator, decides that it must be inside a wooden box. So she says that it's the glass lining of a wooden box that he comes out of the sea with. Because there's a sort of sense that, you know, if he took a glass box in the sea with him, this Jinnish, he would drown. <laughs> so it's so funny seeing them struggle with making the, making the images look real. Anyway, um, so, um, but I think that, the, that I don't need to tell you, I mean, Lily is my student, so I don't need to tell you, but for the rest of the room, the, I mean, it is true that a lot of these um, um, motifs, um, you, you can't really resist thinking of it as symbol rather than uh, simply a narrative element. It's, it's, it's so symbolic of the idea of the preciousness of, of violence, of fragility, of danger, of... Um, you know, the crystal, and I mean, it's, and certainly in Snow White, it's death, and... Mm. So to just say a very small thing about this last one, it's also a very humorous touch, I think. There is a... Uh, a female beauty showcased uh, in a glass case for to see covered in locks. Um, so <laughs> it's yes. an obvious. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, you can, you could even see it. In, I mean, I, do, I don't know if there's been a modern, uh, you know, kind of contemporary reworking of Snow White um, that uses that idea of the kind of woman in a glass case being displayed. Bianca Nieves, which is, I think, a fabulous new film, um, doesn't, um, she's, she's, at the end, she's um, actually not in, oh, she is in a glass coffin, she is, but she's, but she's on a, yeah, she's on, uh, she is in a glass coffin, but actually, it's, it's open, so you don't see it as a, she, that's how she ends up, sorry. At the end of Bianca Nieves, which is a new, wonderful film by Pedro Berger, who's a Catalan filmmaker, um, the modern, contemporary, uh, Snow White is a fabulous bull fighter, <laughs> and um, and and she gets uh, destroyed by her stepmother. And and at the end, she's a circ in a circus, displayed as a freak, a sleeping woman who doesn't decay. And she is on a you know she's you're right. But, but I suddenly when you said about the glass with the locks, I thought of Amsterdam and the women in the windows. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that works. I think in that story, in, in the original Thousand All Night Story, at least in my version, the casket covered in locks and the, so that desire, the male desire to showcase this wonderful woman I have and is mocked mm -hmm. by what she manages to do. So mm -hmm. once again, that is an antidote to this great heaviness, this great. Um, way that the, the jinn in the story um, sees his own possession, sees the woman as his own possession. Yes, yes in fact, um, um, that's right. I mean, the, the, that story, while it, while it can read patent, at a superficial level, can be read as women's notorious wickedness and lust. In fact, it's also a story which warns that women will behave like that if they're abducted on their wedding by, for, by you know, someone um, taken away from their true love. So there's a justification of her, and an implied justification of her as well. Or an implied criticism of the gin. <laughs> Thanks so much for the talk. Uh, I was wondering, you mentioned something about flying and the process of flying, and it's sort of metaphorical for the teller. I'm sorry, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Uh, for the teller and the imagination. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. Uh, well, <laughs> well I, I got very uh, carried away with it in the book. There's an awful lot in my book about it. Um, um, I, I just, I was interested that the flying carpet, in fact, only appears marginally in one story. Um, and uh, otherwise it's in the background as Solomon's vehicle. Um, Solomon is the major uh, powerful um, ruler of the jinn in the, in the whole of the book. So, um, and I just wondered why it had emerged as the single most dominant emblem of the, of the whole book. Um, and it, it's 
rather the, the reason it emerged is more connected with film than it is with written narrative or told narrative. Um, it's after the invention of cinema, at the end of the 1890s, when uh, the first filmmakers are all attracted to the Arabian Nights. Medias makes several Arabian Nights films, and then it goes on very densely. There's a lot of Arabian Nights movies, and including not in, in, in the, not only in the West. Um, there's, there was a lot of um, Arabian Nights movies made very very early. Silent movies made in India. Um, so it's a, it was a there was a recognizable affinity. An affinity was recognized between the kinds of story and the new medium, the possibilities of the new medium. And, um, and, and then the, this idea of flying, the flying carpet, um, started to, it, it, it dominates several of the first silent movies, um, sometimes very comically. Uh, the English one, um, I forget his name, Paul, he was called Robert Paul, I think, from Brighton, um, made the first, um, uh, flying carpet, and it looks so funny because it sort of lifts off in a very clunky way. Um, but it's interesting. It's the in, in his film, it's the wicked fairy is turned into the flying carpet, and those two lovers get on her and fly <laughs> fly away to safety <laughs> from her cave. So um, um, anyway, that's the first one. But it, but there, there's uh, Philippe Alain Michaud, who's the keeper of the curator of film at the Pompidou Centre in Paris. He's actually written a book about the analogies between the surface of the screen and the mobility of light and shadow playing on the screen and the idea of the carpet itself. And he held an exhibition in, um, in Rome um, about on the theme. So that was actually after I wrote my book, we, we, have, we were thinking along the same lines exactly. So that's how it emerged into. It, the film can enact metaphor very effectively. Questions or comments? Or, oh, I better stand away <laughs> from the light. Well, if not, then um, I'm, I really would like uh, you to join me to thank Marina Warner so much again and the whole, you know, all the people who made today such a great success. Thank you very much.